Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Today, we have the honor of having with us uh, one uh, of the most prominent professors of economic history. He's definitely one of the top uh, professors uh, of economic history. Bob Allen is uh, a professor of economic history who has devoted uh, his uh, life uh, to economic development, technological change, environmental history, uh, and public policy as well. Uh, and then uh, he carried out a study on the extinction of whales, and I will ask him uh, why then. So he's really very eclectic. Uh, he has uh, a very rich experience. He teached um, in Vancouver at the British Columbia University, then uh, since uh, 2001 in Oxford, uh, since uh, 2013 at the New York University, and now since uh, 2013 has been teaching in uh, New York University uh, in Abu Dhabi and at uh, Oxford University, where he's uh, a researcher and uh, a pa member of the faculty. has published a number of books uh, that marked uh, the uh, interpretation of uh, uh, economic history, and I'll mention only three of them, but of course he published much more than three. And the relevance of all the other books is definitely at the same level of the ones I'm going to mention. So, uh, Farm to Factory, reinterpretation of uh, the Industrial Soviet uh, Revolution in 2013. Very interesting book. Where he, let's say, revitalizes uh, the role of uh, planning in the first part uh, of uh, the Soviet uh, Industrial uh, Revolution. And then in 2009, he published another very innovative book. And I'll uh, spend lo uh, some time on this, uh, namely the British Industrial Revolution in a Global Perspective. Uh, and then another very nice booklet uh, with great value, Global Economic history, a very short introduction, and then uh, he published extensively and he was awarded uh, numerous uh, prizes uh, and acknowledgments. But what is perhaps most interesting about Robert Allen is that uh, he focused uh, particularly on uh, reading economic history where the factors of production, the cost of capital, wages, uh, and the cost of energy account for the factors uh, that uh, explain why certain events have occurred in some geographies vis-a-vis -vis others. To do so, He very accurately reconstructed the cost structure, the labor cost structure, the capital cost structure, the uh, cost of living in various ages and in various places using a parameter whereby the cost of wage or the cost of uh, capital and, and so on and so forth has been uh, translated into a silver equivalent. So the silver equivalent of a worker in Vienna in 1870 um, was equivalent to a certain amount of silver or certain uh, amount of grams of silver. So clearly those wages were paid uh, with different currencies, uh, with uh, completely different uh, uh, purchasing powers. Uh, but he managed to re, uh, let's say, construct every, these cost structure very effectively and very accurately. So by assessing the cost of capital, cost of energy, the cost of wages, uh, Allen identified uh, the factor that determines uh, propension to innovation in the combination of some of these factors. Uh, and then, of course, propension to innovation is what then uh, 
determines the wealth of a certain area, of a certain region or a certain country and is what triggers the well-known processes of uh, the first industrial revolution that were then replicated in the following revolutions. In uh, Allen's uh, book, innovation is uh, seen with a kind of romantic eye, and Allen shows that during the first industrial revolution, namely the revolution uh, that uh, changed completely the production systems uh, worldwide and started a very long development process uh, that changed uh, our way of living uh, and our towns and cities as well, um, was uh, determined. So the first Industrial Revolution was originated uh, from uh, the desire of earning money and, con and from the fact that, that uh, in uh, those days in the UK, the cost of, of uh, labor and the cost of energy ratio was particularly favor favorable, and this explains why the Industrial Revolution took place in the UK and not in Germany and France. So the tools it uses uh, help us understand why certain countries are richer than others. Uh, why, for instance, uh, around 1500, uh, the wages were similar in Asia and Europe, and 400 years later, such wages are completely different. Bob Allen enjoys uh, uh, a vintage point uh, when telling about these uh, complex uh, events. Then I must say that uh, the um, British uh, um, professor of economic history writes very, very well. And so he explains how we shifted from uh, uh, the use of coal to melt iron, how we how the advent uh, of uh, the steam engine uh, occurred uh, and why Japan, for instance, managed to shift uh, from the Middle Age ages uh, to modernity in half a century while other countries failed. Uh, and he tells everything about it uh, as if uh, this very complex uh, history of uh, uh, the human uh, being were a uh, novel, which in fact it is. So, we are now on the verge of a new industrial revolution, which we still fail to understand, and we have no idea what impact such a revolution will have on our society and our labor market. And Allen is the best position to make us understand who the winners and the losers uh, will be in this new age by providing us with an interpretation of the previous uh, industrial revolutions. And now, Bob Allen, the floor is to you. Yes. Well, thank you, Marco, for that uh, very generous introduction that uh, reminded me of my theme. So this is, it's an excellent trailer. This is what you're going to hear about. Uh, and thank you very much to uh, the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure. I'm very impressed by the event, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, normally, uh, we academics only uh, speak to uh, students who are uh, forced to sit in front of us and listen. Uh, or to other academics. Uh, so it's a, a great pleasure to be able to uh, talk to uh, uh, an interested and uh, intelligent audience. Uh, so thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, technology and world history and its uh, implications for human well-being. Uh, oh, we're going the wrong way here. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, the whole theme of this conference is about uh, uh, technology and uh, the labor market and who's going to uh, be winner, how, what's going to be our fate with the new technolo technologies that are uh, being adopted today. But I want to begin by, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, it's very hard to uh, anticipate the future. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do time traveling and go back to 1750 at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and you'll be pleased to know that many of the same questions you're asking were asked then, uh, but we know what happened then. So we can kind of run history back, and at least you can see what happened in several of these previous revolutions. 
So as I say, today is not the first time that people have worried about the future of work. You know, will technical change uh, create mass unemployment? Uh, will technical change lower wages? Will all the gains of change go to the top 1%? Uh, well, we can see what happened anyway in the past. Uh, sorry. Um, so, but the stock answer to these questions, the stock answer of economists is everything's going to be okay. Um, it's as a matter of fact, uh, new jobs have been created in the last 200 years, right? The fraction of adults who are working may be at an all-time high now in uh, Western Europe. Um, real wages have gone up quite a lot, right? So comparing your standard of living to that of people 200 years ago, it's, it's a lot better off. Um, so that's the basis for an optimistic view of the future. And it was considered completely normal in the expected uh, outcome in the post-World War II period was captured in the very famous economic model of Professor Solow, written in 1957, that got him a Nobel Prize. It was a model that showed how rising labor productivity translates into rising wages and mass uh, employment, the mass well-being. But I think there's really a kind of balancing act in thinking about this. Uh, it's true that in the long run, a term economists like to use, that's after all the adjustments have taken place and everything's normal again. And in the long run, economic growth and the prosperity of rich countries are caused by new technology and new capital equipment. That's just true. However, in the short run, that is before everything's settled down, um, many people suffer from technical change. There's a lot of losers as well as gainers. And in a sense, a key question is, how long is the short run? You know, it's one thing if uh, there's a technolo new technologies come in, people lose their jobs, but after a year or two, somehow they've got new jobs, they've all been retrained, everything's back kind of the way it was. Maybe that sounds okay. It's quite another thing if the people that are displaced by technical change basically remain placed displaced for the rest of their lives, and the gainers, the winners in the new jobs that are created are their children or their grandchildren. I mean, that's a very different matter. So at least, uh, and this is something that's not often uh, enough considered, I think, and it's something we want to see how this played out in history. Um, so there's a couple of main points I'm going to make. One is that I'm actually a pessimist, so I don't really subscribe wholeheartedly to the optimistic answer of economists. I think there have been long stretches of history when many people have lost out, and I think we have to ask whether we're in another one of those now. Um, another thing, and I've noticed this and I've gone, went to a lot of presentations yesterday, is I think we have to think about these questions on a global scale and not just a national or sort of European scale. Um, there's a lot of a tendency to say, well, some new technology, robots, artificial intelligence is going to be introduced, and what's its implication going to be, and we look at the implication for us. But actually, we live in a global economy, and the fates of people in different parts of the world are linked by trade and uh, migration and so forth. And I think this means that both, well, morally, we should be concerned about everybody in the world and not just about ourselves, but also analytically, we have to be considering what the global ramifications are. I mean, it may well be that a technological improvement that benefits people in one place is having really bad effects in another place, or vice versa, right? So we want to be sensitive to that and see how the global context uh, affects the implications of technical change. So I'm going to do a kind of look at things, continue to look at things in a bit of a grand scale before we get to the Industrial Revolution. And uh, this graph uh, shows you uh, estimates of per capita income in different countries and uh, distinguishes a couple of periods here. So uh, these are, uh, so there's colored lines for the countries shown on the graph. The one point is that in 1500, uh, if you look at uh, average incomes in big regions of the world, like Europe, Asia, Africa, so forth, the difference between the highest and the lowest is about 50%. Right? There's not much difference in average incomes at that point. So if you flash forward then to 1820, when the Industrial Revolution's underway, um, that gap between the richest region and the poorest has grown to about four times. If you come up till today, the gap between the richest and the poorest regions is about 20 times. 
So a lot of the history of the last 500 years has been divergence in the world, that some kind of parts of the world have gotten really rich and others have, well, there's been growth probably everywhere in terms of average income. The difference between the rich and the poor is much greater. And particularly since the Industrial Revolution, uh, we can see this. We have, the data are better, for instance. But what happens there, uh, and you can see this on the graph, is that by 1800, the top line is that for uh, the UK. So it's had the Industrial Revolution. It has the highest average income. It's followed by Italy. Uh, it's Britain overtook Italy since 1500. And then there's Asian uh, economies below that. And much of the story of what's happened since the Industrial Revolution is that the countries that were richest in 1820 have continued to grow fastest, so they really pulled further ahead, and the countries at the bottom have not grown so fast. So you get this divergence. But then more recently, uh, there's been convergence, and some of the poorer countries have started to catch up. Japan was the first to do this, uh, and most recently East Asia and China are making huge uh, strides in this direction. So this is, these are general patterns we want to take account of. Um, so why are some countries rich and some countries poor? And uh, technical change is uh, an important part of the answer. Uh, technological change is the fundamental cause of economic growth. So the kind of question then becomes, why have rich countries invented and used highly capital-intensive technologies while poor countries continue to use labor-intensive technologies? So why do rich countries, for instance, use highly mechanized power looms when they uh, weave cloth, while uh, 300,000 Ethiopians still weave cloth with hand looms like that? Right? So in addressing this, I want to address this question historically, and I want to distinguish three phases of history. So the first is going to be the Industrial Revolution from 1750, roughly, to 1830, so this, this happened in Britain, in the UK, and uh, we want to understand how it happened and why. The second phase, the uh, Western ascent to affluence, is sort of 1830 to 1970. And this is when the Industrial Revolution spreads to uh, most of the rest of Europe and North America and, uh, and indeed to Japan. Um, and the third phase is going to be the uh, problem-ridden present from 1970 till today. So these phases are suggested by Western history, um, but they're relevant, I think, to every... This is not just Eurocentrism, but I think these phases are relevant to all countries because globalization has been com becoming continuously and more important in integrating their fates uh, with each other. So a common chronology comes to describe the history of the world. So phase one, the Industrial Revolution... Why was the Industrial Revolution Britain, British, and why did it happen in the 18th century? So this is a big historical question, right? And there's a lot of different aspects to this, most of which I'm not going to say anything about. There's many people that emphasize political developments, the bright property rights systems that emerge, culture, um, scientific revolution, a vast number of things. Um, but I want to focus on more particularly economic uh, incentives that I think played a key role in explaining the timing and location of the Industrial Revolution. And these were that if we look at uh, Britain uh, compared to other countries, in the 18th century, British wages were remarkably high and energy prices were remarkably cheap. And my basic line of argument is that this made it profitable to use technologies that used a uh, lot of capital and energy to save on labor. So they raised labor productivity and caused economic growth. And because it was profitable to use these technologies in Britain, that's where it was profitable to invent them. I'm not someone that sees inventions as sort of dropping from the sky like rain. Inventions require people to do a lot of work and so they respond to this work as research and development and uh, work responds to economic incentives. So <clears throat> here's a, a graph, uh, which is one of my favorite graphs. It took about 20 years to make this graph. Uh, and what it does is it shows uh, real wages of uh, workers in uh, these cities, London, Amsterdam, Vienna, Florence, uh, Delhi, and Beijing, uh, from the... Uh, middle of the 14th century up until the end of the 19th century. 
So this, uh, this is the result of a big project. It's an attempt to take wage and price histories, which are books that scholars have been writing for 150 years in which they find an institution like a hospital that's been around forever and never threw out any of its financial records. And they go through the financial records and write down every transaction the institution was engaged in. And then they produce tables that show the price of bread every year from the 14th century to the 19th century, the price of meat, the price of uh, whatever, beer, wine. And uh, so uh, in the 1980s, I decided that, uh, uh, and of course, all these numbers are in local weights and measures, which are pre-metric, uh, so they're confusing, and uh, they're all in local currency, so how do you compare them? And I started computerizing these, this information, putting it in spreadsheets. This is one way the technology has increased my productivity. I couldn't have done this before the computer, but I put these things in uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3 originally, and uh, then you could compare them, and it was a question of then converting all the weights and measures to metrics and so forth. And these institutions also all hired building laborers to fix things or build buildings, and so there's information on wage rates uh, in these places. Anyway, uh, so then this is standardized. So the question is, we want to measure the standard of living that some workers that's getting paid in, uh, you know, English shillings or Dutch guilders, you know, how do we compare this over time and between space? So there's a standardized budget that I developed uh, to, which gives the subsistence income of a family. That's the idea for a year. So the idea is to compare the annual wage of a building laborer to the cost of keeping a family at very basic subsistence. And if they're, I uh, look at the ratio. So if the, the wage just equals the subsistence cost of the family, that's one. And uh, if the wage is two, that means the worker earns twice what it costs to keep the family at subsistence. And of course, if it comes out to be a half, there's a big problem for the family. They don't have enough money to buy the subsistence baskets, so there's going to be a crisis. So, you know, it's sort of a perhaps superficial generalization to say that today uh, the standard of living across uh, much of Europe is pretty much the same everywhere. So we could ask, uh, when in the past, uh, if ever, was that last true? And the answer is about 1400. So that's the time when those lines are closest together. Some of the lines, uh, they're rising there at the beginning because there's this important event in history, which is the Black Death in 1348-49 that kills about half, a third to a half the population of much of the world, certainly of Europe. And the result is a big a labor shortage and a big rise in wages. So when you look at these numbers around 1400, um, these laborers are all work, earning several times subsistence. So the Black Death was really bad if you died, but if you didn't die, it was really good. <laughs> At least if you're a wage earner. If you're a property earner, it goes the other way because there's ex too much land around and rents fall. So cathedral building stops because ecclesiastical institutions lose all their income so they can't construct anymore. But if you're a, a laborer, you're in good shape. So there's, at that time, in all these cities in Europe where I can measure it, the wages are quite high and they're pretty similar. And then what you see is you go forward in time. In some countries here, uh, this is London and Amsterdam, the real wage stays basically flat uh, for hundreds of years. But if you look everywhere else, it goes down. And it goes down to about one in the 18th century. So what's happening, so this is true of uh, Central Europe, uh, Southern Europe, and it's true in uh, other parts of the world like uh, India and China where we can now measure the same thing. Uh, measuring this stuff has become a kind of global research project involving a lot of people. Um, so there's these two, these differential patterns. And um, basically what's happening is in, the, in most of the world, uh, there's not much economic change. The population rebounds because incomes are so high in, the, in 1400. As the population gets bigger, less productive land is cultivated, the productivity of labor falls and wages drop, and you end up in the 18th century with everybody at subsistence, and it's not very good. Whereas 
in Northwestern Europe, uh, the wages remain high. So these are parts of the world, Amsterdam and London are the center of big commercial, enter, uh, commercial empires uh, that gain a lot from globalization, from the settlement of uh, European penetration of Asia. The Dutch have a lot of Asian colonies. The British have a lot of American colonies. And these empires will come back to this. They cause economic growth, which maintains wages uh, in this period. So the difference between a prosperous Northwest Europe and the rest of Europe is not the result of the Industrial Revolution. It precedes the Industrial Revolution, and indeed it's my explanation for the Industrial Revolution. So it's not just labor relative to the cost of consumer goods that these things change, but uh, labor relative to the price of capital. So uh, this shows uh, graphs for some countries where I could calculate this out. And you see, like, for France uh, and Austria, there's basically a flat line, and they're the same. The line for England is the same around 1600, but it goes up. So this means that labor is becoming more and more expensive relative to capital. And so this means that the incentives that businesses have to invest in equipment and factories gets greater and greater. So you have to think about this from the point of view of a business. If they're going to in, uh, install some big machine that's going to uh, save labor, that's a big cost. They have this big investment. They're going to spend a lot of money. So right off at the, from the outset, that's a cost. So there has to be an offsetting gain. And the offsetting gain is the savings in labor costs because they save labor. So the amount, they'll save a certain amount, a certain number of hours of labor, say, but the value of that depends on the wage. So the higher the wage, the greater the value of the labor saved, and the more likely it is that the machine will pay. So as wages rise relative to the price of machinery and capital, the incentives to mechanize go up. So in a certain sense, this is also an explanation for why the Industrial Revolution happens in Britain. It's because labor there is becoming more and more expensive relative to capital. It makes in machinery installation more profitable. There's the same story of energy. So I won't go through all the details of this, but uh, <coughs> energy is, is London, as the commercial economy expands, London gets bigger, the demand for fuel goes up. Northeast, the coal in the north of England is exploited and shipped down the coast to uh, London on boats. And so it turns out that uh, this, the lowest pink line there is Newcastle. That's the cheapest energy in the world. That's on the coal fields. And the Industrial Revolution happens on the British coal fields, and it uses this energy. So another factor that contributes to this is the cheap energy you see there. So... As I was saying, this high-wage, cheap energy economy was caused by Britain's foreign trade boom. Uh, this began with wool cloth exports in the 17th century, but it was really consolidated by the creation of an empire. The American colonies, the Caribbean colonies, India, uh, these were central parts. These were huge markets for British handicraft manufacturers. And the result was a big rise in urbanization, from 1500 to 1800, a big expansion of rural manufacturing because much of the textile production took place in people's cottages and tight labor markets met high wages. Uh, that's what happened. This is a very complicated uh, table I won't dwell on for a long time, but it shows the transformation of the economic structure of different countries in Europe from 1500 to 1800. And um, I suppose the important point is that the English economy was the most transformed. You see this in, if you look in 1500 at these, most of these economies have about 75% of their workforce in agriculture, which is like an underdeveloped country in the early 20th century. It's a little lower in the uh, Netherlands and Belgium and also Italy and Spain. Uh, and near the low agricultural labor forces, those countries is balanced by a bigger urban labor force and so urban production was the center of their economies in Italy, Spain, and the low countries are the leading manufacturing centers at the late Middle Ages. And what happens by 1800 is the agricultural share goes down everywhere, the urban shares goes up, and there's also this expansion of what's called rural non-agricultural, which is people working in their cottages spinning and weaving cloth that's exported to the rest of the world. So these transformations go furthest in 
England than anywhere else. And you have a biggest, the big increase in the urban share and a big increase in rural manufacturing uh, in only like a third of the workforce in agriculture at the outset of the Industrial Revolution. So there's this big handicraft manufacturing center which is exporting to the empire, which is a real basis for the high-wage economy that prompts the introduction of machines. Another difference with the past shows up in population and wages. So this, this is Italy. And so the red line at the top is population, and the blue line is the real wage. And you see from 1300 to 1400, the population of Italy drops. That's because of the Black Death. And the real wage goes up a little bit because labor's getting scarce. And then from 1400 onward, the population of Italy gets, keeps going up and up and up and up. And the real wage keeps going down and down and down and down and down. So that's the typical pre-industrial pattern is an inverse relationship between population and wages. So if you look at England, from 1300 to 1600, you see the traditional pattern, right? The population, the red line's lower now. The population drops from 1300 to 1400, stays low, and then goes up to 1600, and at the same time, time inversely when population falls wages go up when population goes up wages go down but then after 1600 it's all different there you've got the population going up and the wage going up so the population's the supply of labor so the wage can go up only if the demand for labor is going up faster than the supply so this rise in the demand for labor is the labor market knock-on effect of the British Empire. All this ma manufacturing that's taking place, these exports to the empire, are influencing the labor market, right? Anyway, uh, so the Industrial Revolution is the creative response to this globalization. So um, it starts with Columbus and Vasco da Gama, their voyages by the late 1600s, uh, there's tremendous imports of manufactured goods from uh, Asia to Europe. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, Asia is the big manufacturing center of the world. All the good products actually are made in Asia in this period. And Europeans don't make anything that Asians want. <laughs> so uh, the trade is all Europeans taking loads of silver from the Americas and going to China and buying stuff and bringing it back. There's no they don't want any of the European stuff. Uh, but these Chinese uh, in, in Indian imports of textiles and pottery, porcelain, are very popular in Europe. And so European firms try to emulate them and copy them. Uh, and, uh, but to compete with uh, Asian producers, uh, British uh, firms have to cut their labor costs. So cotton textiles come, are imported to Britain from uh, India. And uh, they're very, as I say, they're very popular. So British firms try to make them, but British costs are very high using hand technology uh, because uh, their wages are much higher than Indian wages, as we saw. So the only thing they can do is save labor by using machines. So they started inventing machines in the 18th century. And so this is kind of how it works out. Um, this, is a, this is how you did it before by hand. Uh, uh, all around the world, if you're making coarse count uh, cotton yarn, the sort of cotton yarn that would be used to make uh, blue jeans uh, or something even coarser than that, that's the standard product, uh, you do it on a spinning wheel. And you see the woman there with a the spinning wheel, and with her right hand she turns this big wheel. And what the wheel does, there's a string that goes around the big wheel, and then it goes down to a spindle uh, on the right side of that picture. And the whole function of this, she spins the big wheel, the string turns, and the spindle spins. And that's where all the action takes place. And in her left hand, she has what's called a roving, which is sort of coarsely aligned cotton fibers. And they're hooked onto the end of the spindle. And uh, what she does is three things. First, she pulls her hand back, which thins out the fiber. Then she moves her hand to the left so it goes past the end of the spindle. So each time the spindle turns, it twists the fiber. And she gets it the right number of twists, then she moves her hand back between her body and the spindle and winds up the yarn she's just made on the spindle, and then she repeats this. And uh, she does this for 12 hours a day, and she can make like one pound of cotton 
yarn, like half a kilo in a day. And that's her productivity. That's the production process. I couldn't understand all this, actually, so I bought a spinning wheel, which is in my office, and I got a DVD on how to spin, and I tried to do this. And I must say, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. So I have tremendous respect for the women that could actually do it and make a uniform product that doesn't have lumps in it and carry this on for 12 hours a day. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, anyhow, the first spinning wheels, uh, what they do, this is a picture on the left is constructed from James Hargreaves' pat patent specification. And you can see, first of all, there's still one woman. Uh, now, the apparatus is much bigger than the picture you saw before. So there's, it costs more money. A spinning jenny costs more than a wheel. So there's more capital. So the capital labor ratio has gone up. But it, the technology is really just like a spinning wheel writ large. You see that she's got a wheel there that she's turning with her right hand. And there's threads that go out. And you can see the various spindles standing up on the, uh, on the right length. And they all turn as she turns the big wheel. And then she can't hold all these threads with her left hand anymore. So uh, she's got a kind of wooden contraption that she pulls back that draws them all back together. And I think this didn't never worked very well. I asked a woman doing this once in a museum what it was like to work with a spinning jenny. And she said the jenny was really cantankerous. It's like an argumentative, unhappy child. And um, I believe it. But anyway. It increases her output in a day, and she uses more capital in a day. These are other spinning machines. Richard Arkwright develops roller spinning, but it's the same thing. There's more capital per worker and more output per day. The same thing happens with weaving. Um, this is a traditional hand loom. Uh, this is uh, Arkwright's power, uh, development of the power loom. It takes a long time for power looms to be developed. This is really tricky to get a machine to actually weave cotton, but that's how it looks. Um, so those, these technologies come into use. They diffuse through the economy. And what happens? Who gains and who loses? So this, is a, this graph shows you um, output per worker in the British economy as a whole and the real wage across, average real wage across all workers. And I distinguish here between, so two phase, well, First of all, you see output per worker is going up all the time, right? That's economic growth. As output per worker goes up, per capita incomes can go up. Average incomes go up. But we've got to divide this graph into two around 18, in the 1830s. And phase one, which is the left side, shows you what happens for the first two generations of the Industrial Revolution, which is that output per worker is going up, and the average real wage doesn't change at all, right? So you got 60 years there where the benefits of technological progress go to capitalists as rising profits. And on average, the workforce doesn't get anything. And stuff changes uh, in phase two. You see there, output per worker is going up, but the real wage is going up as well. So this is what people um, used to think was normal, right? Economic benefit, benefit economic growth benefiting everybody. Um, and it kicks in around the 1830s, 1840s in Britain. Um, so we're going to want to know, like, why did that change? We'll come back to that. <laughs> Excuse me. So here's another thing that happens. Uh, the last graph showed you the average across all workers, average wage. But this looks at three different jobs. So the left... Uh, the red line is handloom weavers. So these are the guys that made uh, wove cotton with the handlooms. Um, there's a blue line, uh, a middle line there for agricultural laborers, and then there's building laborers. So if we look at the first couple of decades of the graph in the 1770s and 80s, there's not very much difference in the average earnings of these trades. They're all making sort of you know close to twice subsistence. But then you see the big red line shooting up above the others. So that's the handloom weavers. So what's happening there is that the spinning machinery comes on stream in the 1770s and the 1780s. And there's this huge supply of cheap cotton yarn, cotton thread. But it's got to be turned into cloth. 
So there's a big growth in the demand for cloth and for people to weave the cloth. So there's a huge expansion of handloom weaving. And eventually, like, it gets to be 10% of the male workforce of Britain. And at that point, they're run out of people to do the job, and wages go up. So uh, in this first period, wages are very high. In the social history literature, these high wages around 1800, are, that's known as the golden age of the handloom weaver. But here's the thing. Technology kicks in again. So as these wages are very high, they become a target for inventors to invent machinery to save that expensive labor. So that's when the power loom is developed and introduced. And so the power loom's coming into use in the 1820s, and you see the wage of the handloom weavers falling because they're competing against the machines, basically. As the machines drive down the price of cloth, what they can get by weaving cloth by hand keeps going down. So you get to like the 1840s or 50s, and there's huge inequality in the labor market, right? The wages of these trades are no longer the same. The building laborers who were involved in creating the modern system of capital, because they build buildings, their average real wage has gone up, so they've gained. The farm laborers is kind of flat, and the handloom waivers are the big losers. Their wage has gone down to subsistence. And so they either uh, you know, leave the trade and take up some other trade, or something happens, right? But these are, not, these are the losers of the Industrial Revolution, the real losers. This is the real poverty of the Industrial Revolution. So uh, in one of the reactions is uh, uh, to uh, attack machines. The Luddites is a name for a particular movement of people who burnt factories and destroyed machines. But this is very common in Europe. This happens in France, too. There are people that argue that the Industrial Revolution doesn't happen in France because there's no protection for factory owners and anybody that tries to build a factory uh, it's, built, it's burnt down. Um, I think that's extreme, but it certainly happens. But this happens in England lots of times. So usually these uh, people are portrayed as irrational because they're opponents of progress. Uh, but I don't think the people that lose their jobs at this time because of machines, like the handloom weavers, they're not going to get whatever the new jobs are that are created by the Industrial Revolution. Um, maybe their children will. Don't know but they won't. So it's not really irrational for them. I think it's very patronizing to say that they're irrational in what they're doing. From their point of view, they've lost out. So phase two, the Western ascent to affluence. Um, so what happens? Why does Britain turn the corner from uh, flat real wages to rising real wages? Basically what happens is all the hand trades have to be destroyed and replaced by factory trades. So the new technology has to completely overwhelm the traditional economy. So you have the situation where the Industrial Revolution was caused by this huge handicraft sector that developed in Britain. And so it's produced mostly by people working in their own homes and merchants take them raw material and collect product and they have the equipment. So it's the cottage mode of production. And the cottage mode of production does really well. It sustains big increases of output until the key labor for that activity, skilled labor is, is, is all employed. And then wages on that level rise and inventors invent machinery and the, sell, the cottage mode of production basically self-destructs when it hits this contradiction and it's replaced by the factory mode. So it's only when the factory mode takes over completely that the average wage starts to go up. All right, But then it goes up, right? And also inequality declines in this period. There's sort of a big spread of prosperity. It becomes more general. So this sort of, this shows you the graph on the left is what you've already saw about Britain. It's, I've tried to extend the British graph to today, but I can't actually get historically comparable wage data, so I can't do it. But the right graph on the right shows American data uh, from the 1890s to, uh, to today. And you see uh, phase two in the American experience on the left because you've got output per worker in the economy going up and the real wages kind of going up too at the same pace. So this was what normal always used to be. And then you see, though, from 1873 onward, there's this big divergence in the U.S. The U.S. enters phase three. That's where output per worker keeps going up and the average real wage is flat. All right, but we'll get to phase three 
We're going to talk about phase two. So why did the West get rich? Why did we have all this rising output per worker? And basically it's by inventing labor-saving technology. Um, this technology's got an interesting property. So um, today there's a world production function. Is, that's the relationship between inputs and outputs that economists talk about. This represents the technological options of all the countries in the world. So I found this very interesting data. This shows, um, this is for 19, uh, 1965 and 1990. The little reddish dots are 1990 and the blue triangles are uh, 1965. There's 57 countries here in both years. And you see output per worker on the vertical axis and capital per worker on the horizontal axis. And so more capital per worker means you get more output per worker. That's modern technology. So, these, so the rich countries are all on the right and the very poor countries with lot, not much capital, low incomes, they're on, down on the left by zero, right? Now, these points all kind of overlap and they all make a kind of function that you see in economics textbooks. You'll be glad to know that. Uh, that uh, shows this relationship and it flattens out because of diminishing returns. So one of the key things though to notice about this is how things changed. And the thing is like all the change between the two years consists of these new points, these points in the upper right. Like those all represent countries that are down there in the green circle like in 1965 and what's happened is the rich countries there in 1965 have all invented new technology and moved up to the right. So they have more capital per worker and more output per worker. And nothing else in the world has changed, right? So all the technical change that's taking place is going, is rich countries inventing new technology that is more capital per worker and more output per worker. It's the same thing as like going from the spinning wheel to the spinning jenny, but for the whole economy. So since I just discovered this stuff about the spinning jenny, when I saw this, I thought, that's fantastic. That's my story of the Industrial Revolution, right, happening today. So I started this mad little research project of trying to extend all the data backwards from 1965 and the last graph back to the Industrial Revolution. Like, is it the same thing as you go back in the past? And it turns out it's always the same story. Technical change is always something that takes place in the richest countries and they go to, they have one technology, they invent a new technology with more output per worker, more capital per worker, and they kind of abandon where they were before and move to the new place. And they just keep leapfrogging up like that. And it means that nothing ever happens uh, in the other country, other low old fashioned technologies once they've left them. So we can see this, it's kind of like we can play this movie of history now from 1820 onward and see what happens in like the UK, the USA, and Germany. So this is the UK in 1820 with low output per worker, low capital per worker. As the 19th century goes on, they keep, they invent these new technologies that have raised these numbers and they move up the graph like this. So they end up there like in 1965 with, uh, you know, much more capital per worker and much more output per worker. And so they're all kind of rich, right? Now, this is the USA. So I have to say, when I made these numbers and worked all this stuff back, I thought the results were only going to be junk. I couldn't believe that taking all these numbers from different sources and putting them together would give a sensible pattern, but they actually did. So you see the USA starts out there in 1820 a little poorer than the UK, and you see the UK is still ahead, right? The US is growing, but now the US starts catching up later in the 19th century, now they've got more capital per worker and more output per worker. They keep pulling ahead like that. So they end up with a more capital per worker in, in 1965 and a higher standard of living because output per worker is higher. What about Germany? Nope, US ends up there. Here's Germany. They start out a little poorer than the, the UK and the USA and they kind of accumulate capital like that. Now they start to catch up and they make these huge leaps to the right. So their income per person's going up, but they're getting, they're using more and more capital all the time. Like they got way more capital per, per worker than the USA or Britain, right? So you gotta think about Germany. Like what Germany's famous for all its banks. And so investment banks, 
they assemble capital and finance investment. So they're doing this huge job of creating all this capital in Germany, but it doesn't actually make them any more prosperous than anybody else. So I, it makes me wonder about German banks. Is this really a good model? But that's another question. Anyway, so you see how the world evolves like this as these new technologies are invented. So how does this relate to the world as a whole? So if we superimpose this on all that cross-section of countries and they, that we saw before, from the poor to the rich, the lines overlap the data points completely. So what this means is like, the historical paths of development of the rich countries today are the options, the technological options for poor countries. Or like uh, Marx said, the industrially advanced country presents to the less advanced country a picture of the latter's future. Right? All the poor countries can do is climb up the path, the ladder that the wet, rich countries have already made. So, all right. Uh, so as I say, that as rich countries to invent a new technology, they leave the old technology behind, and there's no progress. So this graph looks at the uh, poorest countries, uh, the less than $5,000 capital per worker from all the different time periods together, right? And you can see all these numbers. It looks like a bad rash. And uh, you can't, it don't, there's no point trying to tell which point is which year, although they're color-coded. The thing about it is they don't change. Right? The 1820 points are the same as the 1965 points. Like all the technological progress in the world since 1820, it doesn't have any impact that you can see here on the efficiency of really poor countries. It's all a story about the rich countries. All right, so poor countries are poor because they use antique technology. Like where are poor countries successful in the world economy? It's making clothing. So the clothing uses, that, the technology is a sewing machine. The treadle sewing machines invented in the 1850s, the electric sewing machine in the 1890s, right? This is ancient technology. That's why they're poor. So here's the view from the souk. So when I, go, I was in Marrakesh a couple of years ago, and I saw all the touristy things, but I also looked at the work people were doing. And there's a lot of people doing woodwork. And uh, this is not just sort of some show and tell for tourists. This is actually commercial work. Uh, so this guy is making little wooden things uh, with his uh, a chisel and his toes, and it's a little lathe. And this is a close-up, and you can see there's this wood that's held between two metal spindles, and you see on the right the red bow. So he has this bow that you can see him holding in his right hand, and he moves it back and forth, and that spins the spindle. And then he's got a chisel, uh, which he controls with his left foot. And uh, he cuts the wood, and he, he does woodwork, okay, like that. There's no electric motor. So I asked myself, you know, do you ever see anything like that in Europe? I mean, you never see anything like that now, but historically, do you? And the answer is yes. So this is a picture from 1283. This is European technology, uh, Moroccan style. And you see there's the guy, he's got the bow in his right hand, the chisel in his left foot, and he's doing the woodwork, right? Same, very low capital intensive technology. But Europe's been on this trajectory since the Middle Ages. So you get to the 17th century and people do woodwork uh, with pole lathes. So there's this pole across the top of that picture, a branch of a tree, and the string goes down around the woodwork and then down to a treadle on his foot. And as he pushes it down, it spins the wood around and he can cut it with a chisel. But that costs more. That's a higher capital labor ratio with higher output per worker. So in the 18th century, uh, this is an 18th century gentleman's lathe. This is really expensive. Uh, this is very popular in the 18th century amongst the aristocracy to, use, to do things with lathes. This is Louis XVI's lathe, which is, I have to say, a really spiffy, nice piece of machinery. But, uh, uh, you know, the ruling ideas of the age, are they the hobbies of the ruling class? Um, but artisan lathes, they get more capital intensive too. That's a, a metal treadle lathe from the 1850s, and that's a lathe from today, a, a, a modern electrical lathe. So as these technologies have been developed in the West, output per worker's gone up, capital per worker, that's why you've got rich. It's technology. So why don't Moroccans use electric lathes? So for one thing, it's not that they don't know about them because they tell a joke about them. 
So the joke in the souk is that their equipment is Black and Decker Berber style. Right? Black and Decker is an American tool manufacturer. So um, I think it's uh, one of, there's many parts to an explanation, but I think one part is that uh, it's not worth spending all the money to buy an expensive Black and Decker lathe when labor's so cheap. You know, you don't save much labor cost by, by an expensive lathe. So there's a poverty trap means that poor countries, the technology that poor countries need to become rich countries is not cost effective, and so businesses won't voluntarily adopt it. Anyway, around the world there was uh, this kind of whole spectrum of technologies from with poor countries having low capital intensity and rich countries having rich ones. So why did the West go through this process of inventing these ever more capital intensive, ever more productive technologies. And I think underlying this is a positive feedback system that sustained the growth process. So in most Western countries, there's an expansion of education in the 19th century for various economic and social reasons. And I think that this expanded educational, expanded more ed highly educated population makes it profitable for inventors to invent machinery that uses that educated labor. And so the result is the invention of labor that's or machinery that's more productive but requires educated labor. And as that machinery is introduced, it turn, in turn leads to higher la more wages that are even higher. And so that then induces the invention of machinery that uses even more educated labor. Uh, and more effectively. So there's this positive feedback between education and invention and technological uh, change. So here's like, here it is in pictures. So we've got universities here on the left educating people. And then in the lower right, you've got uh, R&D personnel in Bell Labs who are looked clearly a little crazy, who are uh, playing with new television designs. And then you've got new high-tech jobs, new kinds of jobs that require technical training, like the guy on top who's fixing all the electrical equipment that's the spin-off of all this. So you get this kind of positive feedback that's happened. Now, greater globalization has uh, uh, actually reinforced all these problems. So in the 19th century, you've got steamships, uh, railroads that really reinforce a global economy. And here we can see it. Uh, in one graph. You may have thought that globalization is something that happened in the last 20 years with a container ship, but this will show that you're wrong. So this shows the price of wheat in uh, four markets around the world over the 19th century. So the top, the highest line is London. Uh, and uh, so London is, the British are importing all their food, a lot of their food over this period. So it's a big consumer center. So it has high prices. It's sucking in wheat from other places. The next line below it is the U.S. export price. So America exports a lot of wheat. Then below that we have Kanpur, which is in northern India. They're, they are a big wheat growing area. And then Alexandria in Egypt. And the thing about the graph is on the left, early in the 19th century, these lines are way far apart. Like wheat's really expensive in England and really cheap where it's grown. By the time you get to 1900, they're all together, right? The steamship and the railway have cut freight costs so much that you've got a global market and very little difference between the price of wheat in India and the price of wheat in England. That's when globalization happened. And so this globalization that happens in the 19th century, it has a big impact on factory production. And basically what you've got is deindustrialization from Casablanca to Canton. Uh, all these uh, North Africa, the Middle East, uh, and Asia are all big centers of cotton cloth production, for instance. This is all destroyed by British exports as Britain industrializes and a global economy comes into existence. So the um, upshot of this is that... Uh, uh, so one of the reasons that Britain can expand and one of the reasons it can have this rising real wages as the technology gets better and better is that it has all these foreign markets that it's creating because it's destroying all their local industries. So it's a case where technological progress in Britain is benefiting British workers, but wrecking the lives of textile workers all across Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, 
The other thing is that this is a process that creates what came to be called underdeveloped countries. So underdeveloped countries were these countries in Asia, for instance, that only produced, that were only agricultural, they had no manufacturing, you had to bring them modern industry. That was never their traditional structure. They also, they had a huge amount of handicraft manufacturing for hundreds, thousands of years. And this is all ended in the 19th century because of globalization. That just tells you there. So let's move on quickly to phase three, um, the problem risen present. So you see there on the left, this is the American data, you see on the left how phase two worked with rising output per worker and rising real wages. But since uh, the oil crisis in 1973, uh, the average real wages in the U.S. has gone up a little bit, but not very much at all. And uh, output per worker has gone up a lot. So this is, the difference is profits, and so the incomes of the top 1% are all going up because they're getting all those profits. Um, the same thing happened in the UK. We can look at inequality statistics, but this shows you what are called Gini coefficients, that those measure overall inequality. So they go from 0 to 100, and 100 is complete inequality, and 0 is complete equality. So a big number is means more inequality. So you see there's already a lot of inequality before the Industrial Revolution. Then it goes up, the two highest peaks are during the Industrial Revolution. Then as wages start rising after the middle of the 19th century, inequality goes down, and it gets really low, uh, and then uh, after 1973 it starts going up again. It's gone down a little bit in the last few years, but there's, it's gone up distinctly from the low point. So one other thing is that the um, U.S. labor market uh, shows the same kind of explosion of inequality that the Lancashire labor market did during the first Industrial Revolution. So the right graph shows you uh, two lines. The green line is what are called uh, production and non-supervisory workers. So this line is uh, very widely reported, this time series of wages. So these are basically blue-collar workers and good pr goods-producing industries and clerical and other supervised workers in service industries, food work processors, uh, hairdressers, and so forth. The other, the flip side, is management in both cases and professional workers employed by businesses. So that's the red line. So what you see here is like uh, in, from 1964 to 1984, the average earnings of management and the workforce are not very different, uh, but then they difference. there's a huge difference that emerges after that. And you see that people who have these uh, supervisory kind of jobs have rising wages, uh, whereas the other people have flat wages. So the people with the flat wages voted for Trump, right? And uh, the, the liberal elite that they complain about have the red wages. Uh, so there really is an economic differential here that underlies the, is related to, I'm sure this correlation's not perfect, but it's related to the politics. So how much of the rise in inequality is due to globalization? Now I'm gonna turn into Socratic question mode. This is a picture of the port of Shanghai with all those containers of manufactured goods going off to the west. So that can cause inequality by putting uh, pressure on the uh, wage level in the uh, workforce of the workforce. But how much is due to labor displacing technical change? Um, there's a robot assembling a car. Um, one of the problems in distinguishing these things is that they're linked, and people have known that they were linked since the Industrial Revolution. So here's a quote from 1780. It says, the general rule is infallible that when the price of labor comes to be a more advanced in a manufacturing country than in those of its commercial competitors, then that expensive nation will lose its commerce and go to decay if it does not counterbalance the high price of labor by the seasonal aid of mechanical inventions. Right? So part of the robotization of manufacturing is driven by the need to compete with, save labor costs by competing with lower cost Chinese and foreign labor. So will the positive feedback loop of phase two kick in? And uh, will more education solve all our problems? Um, that worked in phase two, but the global context is now different. In phase two, exports of Western manufacturers destroyed handicraft manufacturers in Asia and Africa, 
producing uh, modern underdeveloped countries. But now that Asia is industrializing, its factory products are deindustrializing the West. So does this mean that a rise in labor income in the West requires the liquidation of all the production jobs, just like the rise of wages in Britain in the Industrial Revolution required the liquidation of all the handicraft jobs? That's a question. And what about these non-production and supervisory employees? Um, do their rising incomes offer grounds for hope? Uh, many of these require a lot of education, but can the sal salaries of software engineers remain high when they compete with Bangalore, the center of the huge Indian software industry where software, software engineers make a lot less than they make in Silicon Valley? Well, there's a question. So a big and ponderable is what drives technological progress. Is it autonomous advance of science or does it respond to incentives? And I've emphasized the latter, which may give hope because it, technological progress is something that responds to the social circumstances in which it takes place. We might be able to influence it by policy. Finally, um, can state policy make things better? So do we need uh, more education so people are fitted out for higher paying jobs? Should we uh, retrain displaced workers uh, who lose out from technical change? And one of the problems with that is that retraining programs don't work really well. Uh, do, do, how about more trade unions, worker protection? Is that going to uh, raise uh, wages and improve labor share, or does this just shift gains and losses among different workers? You know, if you've got there's a lot of labor protection and you have a job, that's good for you, but it makes it harder if you don't have a job. So what about populism? Suppose, you know, is it a good idea to end Asian imports and mass immigration? Is that going to help labor? Or what about guaranteed annual incomes? Maybe we should rethink socialism. Should we socialize profits? Or what about Thomas Piketty's global tax on capital? These are all kind of options out there in the world to think about, all of which address real developments that I've tried to explain. Uh, so uh, I leave you with the questions. Thank you very much. Io ve l'avevo detto che I told you, I told you it was going to be a fascinating uh, presentation and I must say that uh, Bob Allen is always great and a fantastic speaker. I certainly have a, a handful of questions to ask, but I will leave the floor to ask questions first. We've got right like, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very exhaustive uh, uh, presentation and for all your explanations. Uh, but this is a point that is generally neglected by economists, namely environmental limits. Uh, you talked about, actually, you wrote a book about uh, whales extinction, so I believe uh, that you, you took mainly the perspective of uh, the economic historian rather than the environmentalist. But anyway, you said that, that poor countries are poor because they use uh, um, obsolete technology and not advanced technology. If by miracle, uh, Tomorrow, the whole world, uh, down to Africa and up to Bangladesh, could use uh, the same technology that uh, the U.S. uses. Uh, what would the environmental consequences be? Can you introduce yourself, sir? Pierre. Pierre Tosi. So, let's jot down the questions. So if there are other questions, we prefer to collect. Uh, no, no other questions, then you can proceed and answer then. Uh, that's a very important question uh, and a very difficult question. Um, I think that uh, um, I haven't talked about uh, environmental dimensions of this, right? Uh, and it's, uh, it's the case that uh, um, the economic growth that's triggered by the in, uh, Industrial Revolution is, is leading to large, huge numbers of environmental issues. Right, uh, and I think, uh, I don't know the specific answer to your question, but were all of these countries to become richer using today's technology that the impact on the environment would be extreme, right? I mean, there is some hope though that uh, uh, the development paths uh, of these countries are not gonna lead to as much in uh, the same environmental impacts. So like, um, 
uh, as far as, say, global warming is concerned, right, b burning fossil fuels is a serious uh, cause of global warming. So the British Industrial Revolution was all based on coal, and so there was huge, and it led to tremendous amounts of greenhouse gases and so on. And this carried on through the American Industrial Revolution, German, uh, all these economies uh, burn a lot of coal. Um, and it sort of it looked like, uh, you know, China was going to go the same way, right? The, or up, up, up until quite recently, like Chinese industrialization has involved lots of coal. But they are uh, recognizing the environmental problems and trying to address those. But even more important than that, I think, is that there's been huge changes in the price of, uh, of uh, renewable energy sources. So they've dropped tremendously in, in price, right? Uh, so it used to be that uh, burning uh, fossil fu fuels was clearly the cheapest way to produce electricity so that uh, the only hope for dealing with the problem was kind of regulation, prohibiting that, forcing or subsidizing uh, renewable energy and so forth. But now actually um, solar power is uh, cost competitive. So India is installing huge amounts of uh, solar power and not relying on fossil fuels. And the Chinese are doing the same thing. So uh, if it actually is the case that, you know, technology of, of renewables develops as it seems to be, then uh, it, it may, that aspect of the problem may be resolved uh, on its own, which is better than, like, relying on regulation. I mean, if Trump is going to walk away from the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, regulation is not a kind of very effective <laughs> Right? So it's much more effective if it turns out that the technology develops. And it's not just that the technology develops spontaneously. Um, the technology develops through learning and through um, state subsidies uh, of the early phases so that uh, uh, you know, solar panels and renewable panels get cheaper. Another thing we might just notice in, uh, in this is the sort of irony that... Uh, um, if it turns out that uh, cheap solar power really is cheaper than uh, fossil fuels, we owe, owe a lot of thanks to uh, Chinese communist central planning uh, because China uh, chose uh, 12 industries uh, a decade or two ago to become world leaders in, and one was solar panels. So they subsidized the development and production of uh, solar panels. So uh, they've created the uh, cheap solar panel technology that may uh, solve the environmental problem. Right, thank you, Chinese, in this yeah. case. Yes. Se non ci sono altre domande, io... All right, if there are no more questions, uh, I will, from the audience, of course, I would like to ask a quick couple of quick questions. We are living in an age of uh, stagnant wages uh, for workers because of globalization, because of competition with uh, um, cheap uh, labor countries and because of technology that has... Uh, exerted pressure on wages. But at the same time, we witnessed a substantial increase of the remuneration of certain categories of workers who are certainly not blue collars, but particular categories of white collars. According to the mechanisms that you illustrated, does this mean that we cannot expect much innovation in the future to save on labor costs, I mean blue collar costs, because of this labor cost is already very low and this is why there's no innovation and this is also why productivity is not, has not been increasing over the past few years. And can this explain also that most of the investment made on innovation today um, ends up on AI because AI may one day replace the high wage uh, employees or high wage workers. So that was my first question. My second question is just out of curiosity. Why did you ever decide to write a book about uh, the extinction of whales? Uh, first question. Um, yeah, I, that's quite interesting. I had. Uh, I it may well. Uh, I hadn't. I have to think for my, That's a very insightful question. Uh, I think that uh, yes, it may be that uh, as the uh, wages of uh, earning salaries of the uh, professionals and the highly skilled uh, rise, that that does clearly increase the incentive to invent uh, technologies that economize on their, uh, their labor. And uh, AI uh, seems to be one of them. So it may be that this sort of direction of technical change in that direction is uh, something we should have uh, anticipated from the principles I told you, but I hadn't got there myself, so thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, as the whales, uh, 
Um, well, the, um, it's, um, it's slightly a spin-off of uh, actually the project to uh, do the wage and price history of the world. So I mentioned that uh, one of the problems of these price histories that I was computerizing was that the prices from the Middle Ages and the early modern periods, uh, wherever you go, they're all given in terms of local weights and measures. So you have to find some way of standardizing those and figuring out what they are and their metric equivalents are. And it turns out that I, I came across a French book, uh, Tableau de Commerce, that uh, was a kind of businessman's manual. It went through a lot of editions in the 18th century, and it went through all the cities of Europe and indeed the world and discussed their monetary systems and their systems of weights and measures, and it told you how to convert everything into Dutch units, which was okay because I could convert Dutch units to metric units. So that was volume one. So I was using this for my this project you saw the graph from. But turn, there's a volume two. So volume two, it turns out that the person who did this was a real fan of numbers. And he, he went through again for all the countries and cities of the world he surveyed. And he just, he wrote about their societies and economies. And wherever there was a number or a table of numbers, he put it in the book. And I was reading this and uh, reading about the Dutch economy. And I noticed that he had a, uh, a table for the Dutch whaling industry, which every year from, I think, the middle of the 17th century, 1660 or so, up till 1780, he told you the number of whaling ships that went out, the number of, uh, they're going to Greenland, uh, and uh, uh, to, uh, uh, yeah. And he told you the number of ships that went out, the number of whales they killed, the barrels of oil they got, and the price of oil. And I looked at this and I thought, wow, this is really interesting data. This is what fisheries economists use to understand fisheries. Someday maybe I'll study that. And I put it on the shelf. Then I had a PhD student who was uh, uh, trying to get a job. And he'd done his thesis on comparative Canadian and American manufacturing productivity. And he got a job interview very late in the year with a Canadian university in the Maritimes. Uh, and when they told him to come, they said, oh, by the way, this job is half in economics and half in aquatic management. And it would be really good if you could talk about aquatic management. Well, he didn't have a thesis about aquatic management. So he didn't know what to do. And he, he'd done natural resource economics. So I, he came to my office and told me this. And I said, Ian, I've got just the thing. I pulled this off. And I said, go and present, work this up in a presentation. And uh, so he did that. Uh, and he, he had his interview. And they told him at the interview that uh, this was so impressive that they couldn't understand why he didn't do his thesis on it. So they wouldn't hire him. So... <laughs> We decided after that that we had developed do the project ourselves. So we wrote several papers about it. And the next year he went to get a job, and he got a really good job at Queen's University in Ontario, and it was half in economics and half in environmental science because we did the Wales project. Fantastic. Ora, uh, io vorrei ringraziare Bob Allen. I like to thank Bob Allen. I like to thank uh, all of you. But have you ever heard of a, a professor of economics uh, who per has purchased a 17th or 18th century loom to try and understand how it worked? Grazie, Bob. Grazie a tutti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.